Hello, and welcome to the Anxiety Rx podcast. This is the first podcast I'm doing in the video format. I'm still releasing it in audio format, of course, as I usually do. And I made this decision because I think video is a good format for me. The other reason is I got kicked out of my walk-in closet, which is basically my wife's walk-in closet, and she doesn't want me recording in there anymore because it takes up all this space. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll go down into my office and make this a video. So there. So there, Cynthia. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it, actually. I'm looking forward to doing this in a video format because... I think for some reason it seemed to, to have more impact when you see someone's face. Now you can still listen to it, of course. You can still it will still be out on audio. And in this particular episode, I am going to start answering questions in general. And I hope these questions resonate. I'm picking questions that are kind of general so that I hope the questions resonate with you. So this episode will be about answering just your questions about anxiety. Now, I know myself. I know I tend to rant. I go off on these tangents. So what I'm going to do is I'll go off on a bit of a tangent and then I will probably bring it back at the end and give it sort of a succinct, maybe 60-second answer. I'll repeat the question and give you a 60-second answer. So I've got a few questions here that my assistant, Demi, has lined up for me. So the first one is, when is alarm a good thing and should be paid attention to? Well, alarm probably should always be paid attention to. Alarm is really a sense in your body that probably started when you were a child. Not everything is childhood trauma, but most things are. Most people that I see for chronic anxiety had childhood trauma, had childhood wounding. So alarm is just, in my version, in my opinion, is the child in you asking for help at the time that they had the trauma, that they didn't have words. So what happens is we get traumatized. For me, if my dad would go particularly crazy when I was 10 or 11 years old, I would create this feeling in my body that I wasn't aware of at the time, but I can reproduce now, that signals that there's something that's not right. There's an alarm in my system. There's something that I don't have any control over. And that alarm is still in me. There's a part of our brain called the insular cortex. And the insular cortex is kind of like the part of the brain that translates feeling from the body into thinking of the mind. And it translates thinking of the mind into a feeling of the body. So it's kind of like a translator of this bodily sensation of alarm. And I think when we have alarms as children, our insula, which is highly correlated to our bodily sensation, creates almost an emotional signature of trauma. And it reproduces in our body. So for me, it reproduces around my solar plexus area. It's hot. It's about the size of my fist. It pushes up into my heart. It pushes into my spine. This is a reproducible alarm, a a sensation in my body when I get alarmed. And especially if someone mentions suicide or schizophrenia or mental illness, These are all the things my dad dealt with and that I had to deal with as well because he was my dad. So we create this emotional signature, I believe, through the insular cortex in our brain. And I also believe that when we experience trauma and alarm and anxiety now, that same emotional signature, that same bodily program shows up in us. Because I know it shows up in my solar plexus. And when I ask my anxiety peeps that I work with, where does this show up in your body? And they can tell me if we really focus on where this alarm shows up in their body. And this alarm is really their younger self, trapped in time, that's still emanating this alarm. So when is alarm a good thing and should be paid attention to? Well, always, because basically the alarm is your younger self asking for your to be seen, heard, loved, protected in a way that they weren't back then. And if we can go back, if we can show that alarmed child that's still in us, that they are seen, heard, loved, and protected by us, by the adult version of us, then a lot of that alarm can dissipate. And that alarm that's held in the body is a lot of the reason why we have anxiety in the mind. And we pay so much attention to, the, to changing the thoughts in therapy, like think better, think more positively. And there's nothing wrong with that. But unless, if you want to heal anxiety, 
which is truly this sense of alarm in your body, which is truly your younger self asking for your attention now that it didn't get back then, you have to go back and hear the alarm and pay attention to it. Like really find that alarm, really find your younger self. I've found my younger self in my solar plexus hundreds of times and it always helps. It always helps because that's the true root cause of the anxiety. It's not the thoughts of the mind. The mind is a compulsive meaning-making, make-sense machine and what it is doing is it is trying to make sense of your current environment through the eyes of your old trauma. And really, what we have to do is we have to heal the old alarm, which is the old trauma. And we do that, my book talks about that, but we, we do that by connecting with it because that's really why the alarm is there. The alarm is there because it was left alone with no one really to talk to or really express its fear to. So it got, it got solidly placed in our body as alarm. And then we've been chasing our tails all these years thinking that we can fix the thoughts. So we'll show up with social anxiety or health anxiety or OCD or personality disorder or an eating disorder. When really a lot of that is just a traumatized child that is in you that you're not paying attention to. And the reason we don't pay attention to that child is because it hurts. That child is in pain. So if we have, for me, for example, in my solar plexus, there is this alarm. And for many, many years, I didn't want to go down into that alarm. So what I did was I distracted myself by overthinking, by ruminating, by staying in my head. Because if I stayed in my head, I had less of a chance of going down into the pain of my body. So it's really important not to get dings when you're, when you're recording, for one, but it's really important to find that alarm in your system. And that's what I talk about in the book is finding the alarm. Because the alarm is really the royal road to healing your anxiety. You can trick, change your thoughts all you want. But until you actually go in, find that alarm, find that wounded child in you, see them, hear them, love them, and protect them, you're not going to heal from anxiety. You're just going to be basically fixing your thoughts, trying to fix your thoughts, trying to trying to convince yourself that what's what you've imagined is going to happen is going to ha- is not going to happen and that's a never ending story and you're not actually dealing with the underlying root cause of the problem which is this alarm in the body now i told you i was going to go off on a rant and this is what i'm probably going to do when i do q and a as i go off i give you a bit of background as to why this is important i repeat the question and see if i can give you a short answer when is alarm a good thing and should be paid attention to Alarm is a good thing because it's the child in you asking for your love and attention. That's what's happening. So I guess I... uh... Now, this is my alarm. This is funny because I set this to go off about every three hours or so every day. And when when it goes off, I just hit repeat. And then when it goes off, I go into myself. I say, how are you feeling? What's going on in your system right now? Are you in your body? Have you, have you lost it into your mind? What's going on with your alarm right now? And so it's funny that it actually goes off in the middle of while I'm, while I'm recording this. And it's really about learning how to read your body. And it's something that we don't want to do. It's something that we avoid doing because it's painful going back into that old alarm. So I set my timer for about between three and four hours when I get up in the morning. And then it goes off in about three and a half hours. And when it goes off, I pay attention to what's going on in my body, what's going on in my outside world, what's going on in my inside world. Just for two minutes, just to, just to connect, just to find out what's going on. Because so often what we do is we go through our day and if we have a good day, we don't really pay much attention to our body. But if we have a bad day and we're feeling alarmed, our body kind of runs the show at that point. So it's understanding that when you connect with it, which is really all the child in us wants, that child in us just wants to be seen, heard, loved, and protected. Now, I know this sounds a bit woo, right? But I've done all the CBTs, all the LMNOPs, all the different types of therapy. I've done them all. And nothing really made much of a difference until I did psychedelics, which I don't recommend doing. So no hate mail about me recommending psychedelics because I don't. Somatic therapy, which I think is very helpful, and internal family systems therapy. 
I think those three things really turned my life around because they showed me that this alarm that's in my body, a long question for the first, uh, long answer for the first question, by the way, uh, this alarm that's in my body is really the root cause of what's causing most of my pain. And if I try and fix the thoughts, I'm really not actually fixing the underlying problem and it's just going to keep going. So it's, it's checking in with yourself and saying, where are you alarm? Like, where is it in, in your body? And there are some things that I'm going to be putting out in the next few months about how to find the alarm in your system, because it's really important to find that alarm in your system. Because I do believe that that is a remnant of your younger self that feels scared and alone. And you have to connect with them if you're really going to heal. So the first question, when is alarm a good thing and should be paid attention to? The alarm is a very lucky messenger that we have that we can actually pinpoint as a beacon to our younger selves, our younger wounded selves. So as much as we don't want to go down into that alarm, because we don't, because it's painful, we have to. Now, when we were when we were children, we didn't have to. We could keep stuffing it down, stuffing it down, stuffing it down, and staying in our heads and worrying and becoming hypervigilant. And that worked. As a, ch- as a child, that works. But as you get older, that doesn't work anymore. That style of just staying in your heads and, head and worrying just creates more and more and more worry. There's a tenant in neuroscience. This is whatever you focus on, you get more of. So if you focus on worry and hypervigilance, you're going to get more worry and hypervigilance. It's just the way your brain works. And that just makes you more and more anxious as you get older, more and more afraid. So the root cause of what we call anxiety is really this sense of alarm. This sense of alarm is from our younger self. Sorry about the motorcycle. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to, I'm not going to edit all this stuff. So it's really our younger self. This alarm is our younger self. So if our younger self is, is in pain and they're asking for our attention through this pain that they're creating in our body, give it to them. Like give it to them because that's what you need to heal. The problem again is that we don't want to. Not that we don't want to connect with our child. We just don't want to connect with that old pain that that child went through. But until we do that, there's this saying that says you've got to feel it to heal it. Until we connect with that child, we don't heal. I didn't heal. I went through thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of therapy and all sorts of things and nothing really helped. Nothing really helped until I started finding this alarm. And the reason I found this alarm, for those of you who haven't listened to my podcast before, is I I did LSD when I was at my lowest point, when I was so anxious, I was practically suicidal. Well, I was suicidal. And I had to do something. So I did LSD. A friend of mine was an Ayurvedic doctor, so he you know, took me on this LSD journey. And that's when I saw, and I don't, to this day, I don't know exactly how this came about, but I saw that my alarm, I was told that my alarm is the cause of my anxiety. This purple, sharp, hot sensation in my solar plexus is the root cause of my anxiety. And then once I saw that, I started developing a different theory of anxiety. And that's why I wrote the book. That's why I do the work that I do now. Because once I found that that the alarm was the true root cause of my anxiety, I started fixing the real root source of the anxiety and started feeling considerably better. Excuse me, rather than just dealing with the thoughts, because that really wasn't getting me anywhere. I have this analogy that I talk about on podcasts all the time is you're in a rowboat and the rowboat has a hole in it and the the rowboat's filling up with water. And you can bail water out of it. You can keep dumping water out with a bucket, but you're always going to be dumping water out with a bucket. You know, it's it's basically that's what sort of cognitive therapies do is they help you they help you cope with it. They help you dump water out of the side of the boat. But until you go under and you patch that hole in the boat, you fix the alarm, you fix that underlying root cause in the body, which is this hole in the boat, that's when you start healing. That's when you start getting some confidence that, yes, I can handle this pain because I know that I don't have to just compulsively go into my thoughts. I can go into my body, even though it hurts, I can connect with it. So again, this is the longest answer on the face of the earth. I told you I ranted. I'm going to try and get this a little faster. But 
when is alarm a good thing and should be paid attention to? The short answer is the alarm is your younger wounded self. The feeling in your body that you call anxiety is a state of alarm that your mind reads as dangerous. So your mind as a compulsive meaning-making, make-sense machine, reads the alarm in your body and creates all these horrible, worrisome scenarios in your mind, which of course creates more alarm in your body, which creates more worries in your mind. So you get into this alarm anxiety cycle. So it's important to recognize that the alarm is the root cause of your pain. You have to find the alarm in your body because that is your younger wounded self. And once you do that, then you start real healing. So that's question one. That wasn't so bad. (laughs) What was that, like 15 minutes for one question? All right, let's keep going here. Is there a way to unlearn the bodily feelings of anxiety? After I had my first panic attack, my body remembered how it felt, and now it goes straight to it when I'm stressed. Well, this is, this is your alarm. This is basically your alarm. Once you start becoming aware of that alarm in your system, you'll see it more and more, and you'll feel it more and more, which is a good thing which actually is a good thing because now you know the root cause. Now you can do something about it. Now you can put your hand over it. Now you can breathe into it. You can maybe breathe an essential oil. Calming your body is a much more effective way of calming your mind than calming your mind is to try and calm your body. So is there a way to unlearn the the bodily feelings of anxiety? It's not so much unlearning because the amygdala in our brain never forgets. It encodes certain memories, emotions, and the insula, as I was mentioning earlier, creates this emotional signature of trauma in our body. So it will probably come up the same way, but it's just once you know what to do about it, once you know what it is, it it loses a lot of its power. It loses a lot of its ability to, to hurt you because you know that this alarm is actually your younger self asking for your love and attention. And if you start giving it love and attention, you start having this feeling like, oh, I'm actually healing the root cause of this. I'm not just playing around trying to fix my thoughts. I'm actually healing the root cause of this. So it's not about unlearning the bodily feelings. It's actually about getting into those feelings and allowing them to be there and allowing them to process and not pushing them away and not not retreating up into your head. Because as soon as you retreat up into your head, you've lost you've lost the plot. You've lost that alarm. And you really have to be in contact with that alarm to be able to manipulate it and move it and resolve it so that it doesn't run your life anymore. So is there a way to unlearn the bodily feelings of anxiety? No. That's the short answer. Really, those bodily feelings or anxiety are kind of your beacon that will help you heal. So it's not about unlearning the feelings. It's about going into those feelings and acclimatizing to them. And Bessel van der Kolk talks about that in The Body Keeps the Score. We're not teaching people to unlearn their anxiety or get rid of their anxiety. What we're doing is we're showing you how that you can acclimatize to that sensation. Because here's the problem. When people feel that alarm, immediately they go up into their heads, which happened when they were children because there was no way out. There was, they were helpless in that environment that they were in, the trauma environment they were in. They were helpless. So the only avenue they had was to go into their head, to ruminate, to become hypervigilant. But that becomes a pattern that we don't unlearn when we get into our 20s and 30s. We just ride that sucker until the wheels fall off. So we just keep going with this overthinking rumination, go into your head, avoid the alarm. And what I'm saying is, find the alarm and go into it, like swim in it and stay in it as much as you can. Now, I realize panic attacks are excruciating. So if this alarm if, if this alarm comes from like physical, emotional, sexual abuse, you need a therapist. You need someone trained to be able to help you acclimatize to that alarm so that you don't compulsively have to go into your head and overthink and create this alarm anxiety loop that I talk about. So there's this alarm that's in our body The brain, being a meaning-making, make-sense machine, has to do something with that alarm. So it makes thoughts, worries, that are completely consistent with that alarm. So it makes these negative predictions of the future, which scares the shit out of you. And then, of course, that just makes the alarm worse 
which creates more negative thinking, negative worrying, which makes the alarm worse. So you get caught in this alarm anxiety cycle. So what I'm saying is that if you can go in with the alarm and separate it from the anxiety, separate it from the thoughts and just feel the alarm, be able to stay with that alarm, then you start to heal it. Then you start to heal the underlying true root cause of the problem, the true root cause of the anxiety. And the thoughts just fade away. I know that when I deal with my alarm directly, I don't have to worry about the thoughts because the thoughts aren't needed anymore. They were needed when I was a child. When I would go through an alarming experience with my dad or whatever, I needed some hypervigilance. I needed some escape from that, that pain because there was no way out when I was a child. But you're not a child anymore. And we have all these resources that, unfortunately, the way their brain is wired, especially the amygdala, it makes us think that we're still back there. When we go through a trauma now that's reminiscent of the trauma back then, say you got bit by a dog when you're three years old, you don't even remember it, but now you're afraid of dogs. So the amygdala never forgets. So it's not about you know unlearning this thing. It's about getting used to it and knowing this is what the cause is. And once I knew what the cause of my anxiety was, which was this alarm that was stored in my body that I got shown on LSD, once I knew what I was dealing with, then I could freaking do something about it. But before, anxiety just like hung me. Like I, it just would throw me around in the wind because I didn't know what I was dealing with. Now that I know what I'm dealing with is this state of alarm in my body and I direct my attention towards that alarm in my body, like I check in three or four times a day. Where's the alarm? How's it doing? Can I connect with it? Then I'm starting to do something about the root cause of my anxiety as opposed to just trying to fix the thoughts. So is there a way to unlearn the bodily feelings of anxiety? After I had my first panic attack, my body remembered how it felt and now goes straight to it when I'm stressed. Because it's the child in you saying, this is our pain. This is where the pain is. So you go to that child and you find that child and you show them that you are not that you're not there anymore. You are not in that situation anymore. And that you can actually find the part of you that's freaking out and learn how to console that part as opposed to just breathing, you know, five things I can see, five things I can touch, you know, th those things are all fine. But they are ways of coping. The way you heal it is you find the true root source of your anxiety or panic, which is typically a wounded child in you. You see them, hear them, love them, and show them that they are protected. That alarm drops. And when that alarm drops, you don't have the panic anymore. That's just how it works. Next question. How to be able to identify either I'm having an anxiety attack every time I feel pain or get sick, or is it a real pain or illness? Don't know if I'm explaining it well. It's a bit vague. But, but when you have health anxiety, you, you cannot know the difference unless you go to the doctor. Do some tests, check your oxygen, heart palpitations, etc. to know if it's okay or it's a panic attack. So this is what I'm talking about. Once you get to know where your alarm shows up in your system, then that, that can be a beacon. You can start getting the nuances of the alarm. So what I mean by that is for us hypochondriacs, I guess that's an old term now, health anxiety people, we get a worry about our health and then it completely takes us over. So what I'm saying is, where is that in your body? Like where is that alarm sensation that started your health anxiety in the first place? Now, did you, did, excuse me, you have a parent who was sick. Were you sick as a child? I just did a, a, a podcast on health anxiety. So it's important to realize, is this my alarm just causing, just fueling these health anxieties? Because when we have the alarm in our system, it's this really uncomfortable, free-floating negativity. Some people call it the sense of impending doom. And the brain, especially the left hemisphere, especially the left hemisphere, it wants to know what's causing this. So we will start looking at reasons that might be causing this alarm that's in our system. Again, we're being sidetracked from the true cause, which is this alarm that's in our, it's in our body, into these health anxiety worries. Because the thing about health anxiety is you can never be 100% healthy. 
we there's always some chance you could have some illness there, which is what we hate about health anxiety if you have it. Because you can never reassure yourself that you're 100% healthy. And on top of that, when you Google your symptoms or whatever, you just make it worse. You just make yourself worse, but you're in the wrong ballpark. You're, you're trying to fix a, a physical issue. You're trying to fix the physical issue of alarm that's, that's flared up in your system by figuring out in your head what this could be. Oh, I can solve this health anxiety, so I'll go into health anxiety rather than dealing with the root cause, which is alarm. So again, it's finding this alarm. It's so key and it's so missed. Like this is the thing that that really just boggles my mind for so many years. This alarm has been missed by psychologists, psychiatrists, psychologists as a way of just trying to deal with the thoughts instead of the true underlying cause because they didn't know what the underlying cause is. I'm telling you what the underlying cause is. The underlying cause is alarm. The alarm started when you were a child, typically, not always, but typically. I feel like Seinfeld a bit there. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But this is this is the problem. It's alarm. There's alarm in your system. And your brain is a meaning-making, make-sense machine. So when there's alarm in your system, which is typically old trauma that's kind of lit up in your body, your brain has to make a reason for that. So it comes out in, I'm afraid of crowds. I'm afraid of having an illness. It comes out in health anxiety. But that health anxiety is not the problem. The problem is this alarm that's in your system that's probably been in your system since you've been a child. And we've never really dealt with it. And all these... All these cognitive therapies that are trying to fix your thoughts. Oh, you're fine. You know this. You know this has no reason. There's no uh, factual basis behind this. You take your thoughts and just deaminate them and break them down and see that they're not real. It's like the part of your brain that would deaminate those thoughts, would take those thoughts apart, is offline because you're so deep in survival. You've convinced yourself that you're dying. So you don't have the rational brain. It's like trying to do an algebra equation when there's a knife to your throat. The part of your brain that's actually rational has been shut off by this survival physiology, by this alarm. So you can't reason your way out of this. So here's, here's a little thing that I, that I tell people about that is when we get alarmed in our body, our mind being the meaning make, meaning making makes sense machine it is, it has to know. It has to know what's going on. So to minimize uncertainty, what it will do is it'll start making up a worry. And that worry, even though it's painful, I might have a tumor, I might you know, die of this or that, it makes sense of what was previously unknown or uncertain. Because uncertainty in childhood, for those of us with trauma, was excruciating. So we will do anything to avoid uncertainty. And that includes making up a scary worry like I have cancer, I have a, I'm having a heart attack, I'm having a stroke. That is seen by our nervous system as a better option than just leaving something uncertain, which is really unfortunate because all that does is it just creates more and more worry. So, how to be how to able to be identify? I think I this. How do I identify if this is a true symptom, or whether or not it's something that is coming from my my body my, tr- my like let me say this right how do i how do i discern whether or not this is a real symptom or this is coming from my anxiety once you are really adept at finding your alarm if your alarm isn't up while you have this symptom there's a good chance that it may be physical if your alarm is up while you have this symptom it doesn't rule out but it certainly makes it more suspicious that what you're doing is you've got an alarm in your body first, and then to avoid uncertainty, you're going to make a health worry out of that to try and make the uncertain more certain. So it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to discern. But once you learn about your alarm and how it presents and how it feels and all the nuances of your alarm, you can start saying, "Oh, you know, this is my alarm coming up." So. Here's a little thing. So if you have this symptom that you're worried about, whatever the symptom is, say it's heart palpitations. So if you have this symptom of heart palpitations and your alarm isn't up at the same time, maybe get that checked out. Doesn't necessarily mean that it is the problem, but 
if you have the symptom, say I've, I've got this you know, constricted throat and your alarm is up at the same time, there's a good chance that that's probably an anxiety symptom. So if your symptom is related to your alarm, there's a good chance that it's probably something you're somaticizing or something that your, your alarm is creating in your body. But if you have the symptom without the alarm, then it's more likely, not always, but it's more likely that it's a, a real physical symptom than just coming from your anxiety. So let me just see. I don't know how deep I am into this one here. What are your thoughts on practices to regulate the nervous system to help with the alarm in the body? I think they're great. I think breath work. I think smelling an essential oil. I think self-touch, um, movement, exercise, all those things are great. The thing about those things, is, though, is that they're all kind of Band-Aids. They're all kind of temporary solutions for what's a long-term problem. If you're really going to heal the alarm in your system, you have to go back and find the wounded child that's in you, see them, hear them, love them, and protect them. That's what's going to heal your anxiety ultimately because your anxiety is really caused by your alarm. So alarm is the ultimate cause of anxiety. You have to deal with the alarm first, which is the wounded child in you, and that's how you heal. Just dealing with you know breathing, yoga, all this kind of stuff, it helps. It, it regulates your system a little bit, but it really doesn't make a, a place of healing. It gives you the substrate for healing, but to really heal, you have to go back and find that wounded child in you and see them, hear them, love them, and protect them. So what are your thoughts on practices to regulate the nervous system to help with alarm in the body? I think they're great. But I also see that they're kind of band-aids. Same with mindfulness to some extent. In a way, that's a bit of an escape. Anything that, that makes you feel better but doesn't actually connect you to the true cause of the problem, that wounded child that's still in you through your insula, through the amygdala, whatever you want to call it, if you don't deal with that wounded child that's in you, you're always going to have some kind of alarm. And when you have alarm, you're always going to have some kind of anxiety. Now, you can learn to deal with the alarm on its own and separate it from the anxious thoughts. And that should be a separate podcast because that's, that's an amazing tool. But the, the short-term tools will help you cope, but they won't help you heal. To heal, you have to go back and find that child and heal them and see them, hear them, love them and, and show them they're protected and that they're not back there anymore. Show that child, hey, we are not back there because the amygdala has no sense of time. So when we get back into that feeling, that, that emotional signature in our body that we are alarmed, part of us is 10 years old. I remember watching my dad being hauled off in the ambulance I can still remember that. And it, and it fires up my solar plexus. It fires up that alarm in my system, even the memory of it. So it's really getting to know the state of alarm in your system because that's the true root cause of what you call anxiety. And if we try and fix the alarm, if we try and connect with the alarm, which is our, our younger self asking for our attention, then you start to heal. But if you just try and fix the thoughts by rearranging thoughts, you're just going to be rearranging deck chairs or as I call just bailing water. So I'll do one more because I don't know how long it is. I don't want to go longer than half an hour. So thoughts on using hypnotherapy to cure anxiety and PTSD. I think hypnotherapy is great. I think it starts getting us into those subcortical structures, the structures beneath the cortex that do a lot of this sort of implicit memory, body memory kind of things. So it gets us deeper. Hypnosis gets us deeper into those old traumas. Again, though, it is one of those things that unless you have a practice of connecting with that younger version of yourself, all these practices will help you, but they won't heal you. And this is coming from you know, 35, 40 years of my own journey of trying to heal my own anxiety. A lot of these things helped me feel better. EMDR, hypnotherapy, all the, they made me feel better. But until I started connecting with that younger wounded boy in me who had a father who was schizophrenic and bipolar and unpredictable, never abusive or violent, but unpredictable, that's when I started to heal, is when I dealt with the alarm directly, when I found the child in me directly. And I know that sounds woo and coming from a, an MD neuroscientist that I am, sometimes I want to have a seizure when I talk about this stuff because it sounds so unscientific. But really... It's about finding the alarm in your body 
and using that alarm as a conduit to the younger version of yourself that just needs to be seen, heard, held, loved, protected, and just cared for. Because the less we care for that that wounded child, that alarmed child in us, the more anxious we're going to be. And we're going to be chasing our tails trying to find all these ways of making our body feel better, but don't actually address the true root cause, which is the alarm in your body that's been there probably since you were a child. So that's how I'm going to wind up today. And that's my first video episode of the Anxiety Rx podcast. I hope you liked it. I hope I didn't ramble too much. I do tend to rant, um, but I think there's some stream of consciousness in there. I think that people tend to understand better when I go off on these little rants because I think they see themselves in it. So I'm going to continue doing it this way because, like I said, my wife kicked me out of the walk-in closet. So this is my format from now on. I hope you like it, and we'll see you next time.